going to talk about learning to cope, which we've touched on. And some of you have a good idea of ideas of how to cope when we talked about those four stages, which are, anybody? Irritability. Irritability. <laughs> Zealot. 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 Zombie. 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 There you go. Zombies are last. So types of self-care, physical self-care, everybody knows about, being on the treadmill, going for a walk. How many people have seen the waterfalls here? Excellent. My hand should not be up. I have not, but I'm planning to do that tomorrow. So doing things that help you physically that are not running through the shelter or running after someone, but they're actually physically for you. Um, emotionally, so working with people to be kind, compassion, kindness in our shelters, working with your family, doing things that support you emotionally, going to the kind of movies that you enjoy is emotional support, whether you think about it or not. Ever been to, like, what movies? Um, okay, well, I'm going to date myself and say, when everybody went to Rocky way back in the day and people left the Rocky movie, people felt inspired. That was the day to go run on the treadmill because you felt like you could do it, right? Those kinds of movies, some people have a talent for making them, the movies that make you feel good walking out the door. So if you know what those are, go watch those. How many of us watch true crime and forensic files? And isn't it weird that we're drawn to those shows? It's really interesting that we're these compassionate, caring, giving people that are like, yeah, did you see the one where this person was beaten to death? Maybe it's a stress release, I don't know. Um, so social boundaries, support systems, uh, having somebody that's there for you that you are also there for is really important. Um, my husband is very supportive of what I do. He really believes in the mission, and he is often without me. I travel a lot in my job. I'm often gone. My kids really believe in what I do. When, when people talk to them about who their mom is, they don't say, oh, yeah, my mom wasn't there to cook dinner last night. They say, my mom's out saving animals. They really believe in the mission. So my husband had a small surgery recently, and he got MRSA coming out of the surgery. Um, and we just passed our 100,000th animal transported at the ASPCA. And so as the transport team, I was in New York, and he was fine. He was recovering from his surgery. Everything was great. Um, I got home, and he was deathly ill, and the kids thought he had the flu. So thank God I got home in time and uh, that I didn't go and celebrate the 100,000th animal and lose my husband, which was very close to where we were. But the purpose of that story is that so me, who's always extremely engaged, on the road, gone, with my team, doing things, everything had to stop in order for me to be home and take care of him for six weeks because he had to have IV infusions twice a day for six weeks to try to kill this stuff. And during the time that we were going through that, he had to go in for a second surgery um, because this infection came back. And so twice, MRSA tried to take him during this time. And what was really interesting about that is that I'm the caregiver for the children, for everything, and it had never occurred to him what it would be like if something like that happened. And he was so used to me being very committed to what I do, and he's always known me as this mission-driven person. And he said to me when this was all done, he said, you know, I don't think I ever thought I'd have anybody in my life that would drop everything for me. And to me, that was so bizarre, because of course you would. You know, how could you not? But so he said, you know, I've never thought that I'd be any good at this, but I promise if this ever happens to you, that I'll take care of you too. I hope he still remembers that if it ever happens, and I hope it never <laughs> happens. We'll see. So spiritually, um, whether you have a higher being that you believe in or whether your spirituality is in nature, um, some people go to the waterfall, and that's where they feel the closest to their spiritual self. It's totally up to you what your beliefs are and what makes you feel that way, but find something that does. It doesn't have to be an organized religion or anything else. It can be just something that puts you in touch with your own spirit. Um, personal. How many of you have hobbies outside of animal welfare that have nothing to do with animals? What? Uh, photography. Photography. This one, too. Oh, music. music. What kind of music? Uh, like what do you play? Uh, a lot. <laughs> wow. Talent. I don't have that talent. Who else? Theater, that's really fun. Become somebody else for a while. Yeah. Uh, 
Ballroom dancing, that's a great one. That's exercise and fun. Photography. Photography. Anybody else? Pottery. Pottery, that's really cool. Creativity, see all the creativity? Everybody had a creative one. Wow, super fan. That's awesome, too. Every baseball stadium. So whatever it is that you like to do, make sure you don't lose track of those hobbies, of doing something else that isn't completely related to animals. Um, having a healthy living env environment, having a safe space. Have you ever walked, like, spent your time cleaning your house or cleaning your office, and the next time you walk in, you're like, ooh, wow. It's a completely different space because normally you're running and you're piling and you've got this pile that's going to go to here and this, this is bills and this is whatever. It's really interesting how cleaning your space really helps with your um, peace of mind unless you can't find all the stuff that you had piled in good piles. I always say, I know what's there, I really do. So financial, um, saving money, budgeting your money, Sometimes having a little splurge, but knowing that you can afford that splurge, that it's not going to take you over the edge. So it's really important, especially as you go up and down the stages of compassion fatigue, that laying in your bed and spending all your money on Amazon isn't what you do, and then you're like, oh my gosh, there's 22 packages coming, and I can't even think of what I ordered. Those social, those social media, those uh, internet uh, ways to get yourself in trouble have really got some people sucked in almost like uh, gambling did, where it's like, oh, look at bargain. Oh, look, it's an Amazon deal or whatever they call those things. And uh, so it's really important like, after a certain time to get that phone out of your room. Don't even have it with you. My, my kids, I have them have a habit of leaving their phones plugged in in the kitchen because otherwise they, I find that you know, they just watch one movie, and then it's 2 a.m., and you know, you're trying to drag them out of bed in the morning. You're like, did you guys watch a movie? Well, yeah, but just for a little while. You know, it's, like it's really important to be able to disconnect. Uh, managing your time, uh, having a positive workplace, um, learning new things is really great. Get, keeping your mind growing, not just getting stagnated into the same thing. So lots of types of self-care. Um, if you feel that it's beneficial to you. Um, having therapy is sometimes really great for people, especially if you feel like some of the problems that you have at work are because of baggage that you're bringing with you. Um, if you are in a relationship and you're going through the same pattern that you've gone through before in other relationships that haven't worked out, that's the time to maybe consider, how can I unpack this baggage? And therapy can be a really good way to do that. Um, some organizations have EAPs to help you when really bad things are happening with you or just difficult things, losing a spouse or a parent or those sorts of things, those, those are um, benefits at an organization that are there to support you. Um, when I uh, originally was working at the shelter where all the euthanasia happened, we had no support whatsoever. You just gutted through things. You could be the person that was euthanizing, the person that was hauling bodies to the landfill, like all the bad things that happened you could do in one day. And so when I had my shelter years later, um, we had a take five room. And that take five room was a absolutely quiet, nobody goes in there and bothers anybody else area. So that when you felt like something had happened that you needed to process for a minute, so that you didn't yell at the person next to you, or uh, smack the wall, or yell at a dog, or whatever, you were allowed to go into the take five room. And it really was five. You weren't allowed to just go in there and, and retire on the job. You had, to, you had to come back out. But you knew that you had that if you needed it. And it was surprising how very few people took advantage of it when they needed it, but how much less people yelled at each other, were nasty to each other, um, had those kinds of feelings, because they felt like they had that safety valve sitting there if they needed it. And they knew that they were supported by the rest of the team if they were in there, that you wouldn't go and knock on the door and say, hey, where did you leave that chart? I really needed that. That, they, that would be their space. Um, stress email forums. Uh, there are email forums about compassion fatigue that you can get on and you can watch people talk about things like that and how they've built resilience and those kind of things. I'm on an aging horsewoman <laughs> Facebook group. And you would think that was really funny, but there's actually like a couple thousand women on this group, um, 50 and older, that love their horses still and are doing things with their horses from all over the world. And we share with each other, like losing your horse or, or riding your horse or doing something new. And a lot of people hurt themselves on this forum because we're older women riding horses. And they post pictures of themselves, like with their broken arm or their face. And usually they post, the doctor says it'll be about a month before I can get back on. You know, and it's really funny because it makes you think, 
ooh, this is a really dangerous thing that I'm doing. But it also shows you that these people that are much older than you that are still doing something that you love to do. So there's lots and lots of different forums out there that you can join with things that you enjoy. Um, so how many people turn on the radio or whatever device you have now that plays music in the car? So for years I had little kids and I had a mommy van with a DVD player in it. And so I had the Blue's Clues theme in my head until I wanted my head to pop off. And I'd be so aggravated at the end of those rides. And I thought, I'm such a terrible mom. I don't know why I'm so aggravated all the time. And then the kids got older, and we sold the mommy van. And I was in the van one day, and I went, oh my gosh, there's a radio in this thing. And I can turn it on, and there's no one else in the car. And I realized how much I had missed listening to music that I enjoyed. And so now I try to do that. When I'm in the car alone, I turn on different kinds of music. So not just the blotting out the world with the ear headphones on all the time, but the actual like seeking out music that you enjoy and then immersing yourself in it for a little while is really very therapeutic. Um, we talked about the movies. Um, vacation time. Vacation time shouldn't be optional, right? How many people just are like, oh yeah, I still have all that vacation time left I haven't used. How many people leave vacation on the table for the next year? A lot, right? We end up with lots of, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I've accumulated four months worth of vacation time. Well, I could never leave for four months. And there's probably policies against leaving for an extended period of time. But that stuff's also your pop-off valve. It's in the system. It's built in as a pop-off valve. Most people in Europe have six weeks of vacation in every job. And they can take it in a trot, like all at the same time. And their lives are so different than ours are because they prioritize that over always working, and we prioritize working and admiring each other for how many hours we can put in, as opposed to, oh, wow, you went there. Oh, show me pictures of your amazing trip to Europe. Um, my cousin, when she finished college, um, she and her then boyfriend, who then became her husband, they took a year off, and they biked around, they live in England, and they biked all around Europe, and they just stopped in different communities and took a job and earned enough money to continue on to the next location. I could never do that. I, could, I was amazed that they had done that, that kind of insecurity of going and just not knowing whether you were going to have enough money to eat tomorrow, but you could figure it out along the way. But I admire her so much for that. And now that she's much older, she has that whole year of those amazing memories of just saying, okay, I'm going to do this for me before I get into the workforce. So different way of looking at life, and maybe we need to think a little bit about how we do things. Um, <laughs> dining, not gulping food. Um, Jim Tedford from the association and I, we were walking through this beautiful store down here that was selling all of these gorgeous glass pieces for the table and um, napkin rings and beautiful embroidered napkins. And I thought, I remember when we used to, every Sunday, my family, we sat down to a table like that. And who does that anymore? You see China that you, do you do it? That's awesome. You see China that used to cost, you know, a couple thousand dollars that's for sale as 18 bucks for the whole set on eBay because we don't eat that way anymore. But we often eat in front of the TV or walking out the door or in the car. So if that's what you do all the time, try to make at least one meal a week where you all sit down and all the technology goes away and you actually talk to the other people at the table. You'll be surprised what you find out. And if you're alone, Try to go sit somewhere beautiful and have your meal. Go on a picnic. We used to go on picnics all the time when I was a kid. We used to eat egg salad and all kinds of stuff that had been in a cooler that didn't maintain cool at all. <laughs> we survived, but we don't do those things anymore. And it's, it's a good thing to bring into your life. Um, contact with your family. Uh, and so then another thing that, not being a therapist, but I bring up is workplace violence. Because we are people that are very caring, we often bring people into our lives that aren't the people that should necessarily be there to support us, that are people that are there to hurt us. And they're often drawn to us because we're the kind of people that care. We care about their pain. We care that they have this dysfunction. We care about them, and some of us can be hurt by those people. So if you're working with someone else that you think is being hurt at home, that's something that needs to be, you need to have a plan in your organization to address. That's totally different than somebody that comes into your organization to hurt you, which can also happen. This is a very passionate field now, 
and what was unimaginable to us before is now very likely to happen in some community somewhere that somebody that read on the internet that one of you did something that they don't like with an animal to an animal may not even be true, but if it's on the internet, it has to be true, right? And they get some, some crazy um, notion that they wanna hurt you, that can happen. So your organization should be planning for these sorts of things. It's very important to talk to each other about, what do I do if I think that somebody is being hurt, and what do I do if I think that we're in danger? Do we have a lockdown mode? Do we have a place that we can go? How do we deal with those kinds of things? Um, when I worked in Virginia, we had a dog that had, this was seven, no, early 90s. We had a dog that was completely covered in sores and um, in really awful shape that came in no collar, of course, because it had sores, but um, our veterinarian determined that the dog was suffering and that the dog should be euthanized, and so it was. The next day, the owner of the dog called, and we explained what had happened because of these horrible skin problems. And the man was very rational on the phone and said, I, I understand, we shouldn't let him get out. He really did have a lot of problems. We were, we were trying to treat him at one point. We ran out of money. Um, can I come and get him? Can I come get his body? Because we'd like to bury him at home. Of course. You know, of course, what, you know, you've, you've euthanized the man's pet. What, what else could you possibly do? Very rational on the phone. Came into the front office where I was behind the desk and the door was here and the kennel went that way. Came into the front office, blew through the kennel, opened all the doors in the kennels, let all the dogs out of the kennels. Major dog fight going on in the hallway. Turned around, came back through, picked up the desk and threw it at me. And then turned around, picked up the copier, smashed it on the floor, threw his card down on the floor, and he said, I'm sure you'll be calling the police. This is how they can reach me. And he left. Most terrifying experience of my life, I thought he was going to kill me. So no indication on the phone, no idea that he was going to come in and be violent like that, um, and no plan back then at all. If he had just pulled a gun or whatever, no plan. Nobody knew what to do. The staff all were trying to deal with the dog fight that was going on in the kennel where he had let all the dogs out. They didn't even know what was happening to me up front. So, you know, fortunately he didn't hurt me, but he was a bail bondsman, and so they let him go. He, they did nothing to him at all. Of course he was upset. Horrible us had euthanized his pet. He had a right to be upset, and he did, but he didn't have the right to take it to that level. So those are the kind of things you need to talk about as an organization and decide how will we protect each other? What would we do? Is there a way, if we were suddenly outside the building and we were the only one, that we could still call for help. Is there, who would we call? Do you have a panic button anywhere in your facility that you might be able to call the police or somebody like that? It's, it's, it's sad, but it's our reality. And that was a long time ago, so. So when compassion fatigue leaves, the joy of caring returns. It's a cycle, it goes up and down. Some days you're just gonna feel like, oh, I just oh, I can't go there today. And if that's really the way you feel, maybe you don't need to go there today. It doesn't always have to be every day just you. We should support each other. Okay, so how often does your world look like this? Lots of waterfalls around here that we can walk to. I'll be there tomorrow. How often do we seek this out for ourselves? Do we feel that we deserve this for a week, for 10 days? Wow, for two weeks. Can you imagine being gone that long somewhere like that instead of somewhere like this? instead of like this, which is so many of our reality, hopefully not that many in one kennel, but. Okay, so don't worry, be happy. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? Um, focusing on the positive things, talking to people that you trust, that care about you, that are there to help you. Lots of people that don't live in this industry. Have people had friends that they're no longer friends with because of what they do? Yeah? People that you love, that you can think about, that you're like, wow, I've lost contact with them because I'm immersed in the mission. Look them up because they'll talk to you about other things than the work. We tend to hang with people that talk about the work because they understand that they're also immersed in the work. Instead of seeking out people that are gonna talk about ballroom dancing or art or music or those things, if you have those things in your life and those people that may not even have a pet, who knows why, but there are those people, <laughs> that's a good thing too. So the crisis will pass with or without you being negatively engaged. Kind of interesting, isn't it? 
So if you were on vacation, like my cousin, out there riding around Europe, and terrible negative things happened at your organization while you were there, while you were gone, and everybody else was working on it and fixing it, and you came back and that was over, it happened without you, and everything's fine. Right? And what we talked about earlier with that training across the lines, letting everybody know each other's job well enough that you can step away and leave your phone behind and not have to worry about it. I went to Cuba this year before the ban on Cuba. I was very lucky. Um, and it was scary to leave the whole team and for them not to be able to contact me at all. I'm sure they were thrilled. Um, <laughs> but but it was... It was good, it was really good to disconnect and be with my friend who had just retired and see a place that you know, not, maybe none of us will see anymore. You know, it was a very interesting, um, completely different environment to live in and I was able to electronically disconnect, which is really important. Okay, so ProQual, 3,000 people initially were surveyed and they created this document that's in front of you that has all the little questions. Um, that's, ProQual stands for Professional Quality of Life. And it applies to the work we do, it applies to nurses, it applies to anybody in a caregiving position. And it's a barometer. And that's all it is, is it's questions that they ask you that they've calculated in a certain way so that they can take a barometer of how you're doing. How are you doing now? So this document shouldn't be something that you do once, it should be something that you implement in your organization where you say, every month or every three months, depending on how you feel your organization's doing, um, we're gonna do this on a regular basis. And you might flag some people that you think are doing great that suddenly realize that they're not. Um, the first time I did this as a director at the animal shelter for my own team, one of my most trusted, wonderful team members left us, left for the profession for two years, I guess, because she took this and she realized how far down the scale she was. And, she decided that she needed a break. She needed to get away. And now I've run into her a couple months ago and she's in, back in the business and she's so great at it and so happy. And she's like, I really needed that break and that document told her that. So I'm not advocating for everybody leaving the profession at all, but it is important to ask yourself questions about how you're doing. And it seems silly like a, you know, a little test you'd take in the magazine back in the day, but it isn't. It's something that's looking inside you and saying, how are you doing? Do you need help? How are you feeling about this? So what it will tell you is it's, there's a compassion satisfaction scale. Compassion satisfaction tells you how much satisfaction you're finding out of doing your job. Are you feeling good about it? So this is the scale of how good you're feeling, okay? And if you look on the page, we'll see the little chart next to it. This tells you with, with the number that you get, what percentage your score is, and whether you are, this is a high number that you want, whether you are feeling really good right now, and your compassion satisfaction is good, whether you're struggling a little bit, or whether you're really struggling a lot, okay, to feel good about what you do. Second part is how burned out you are, how much you just feel like you can't do this. And this one is, important to do, you can do them separately, but you should do them together so that you also see the good with the bad. And then the third one is secondary traumatic stress. How much of that PTSD feeling that you're having, how much you're repeating things in your head, not sleeping at night, your Fitbit's unhappy with you, those kinds of things. So it's not just dissatisfaction with the job, it's what you're carrying with you. So I am not gonna ask you to do those right now. I'm gonna ask you to take those back with you and do those later when you have time alone because it takes a lot of time because there's math involved, lots of math. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to add up this list of numbers sometimes. So when we do this as a half day workshop or as a whole day workshop, we go through it and we talk about this and, and people have their numbers in front of them when they're thinking about it. And we don't share those numbers, but it's important that you know them. So don't just put that paper in your bag and not worry about it anymore. Really do this when you get home. You can do it in your hotel. You can do it with your whole group. It's available online. It's a free document. It's the professional quality of life scale, um, and it's something that you can easily have available in your shelter for people to do whenever they feel like it. But I do encourage you to add it to what you do in your organization. Nobody has to share their numbers, but they should be looking at this and discussing it. Okay. <laughs> so when you look at that document, don't let it 
scare or, or upset you if you're having a problem. If you're feeling a little burned out, that's good to know because if you can't fix what you don't know about, right? If you're terribly sick and you don't know anything about it, you can't take the medicine that's gonna help you be better. And this is just emotional medicine. So not just stress, but pain is a part of our life. And some of the worst pain that people have is death, death of your pet, death of your, fa some, your family member, your good friends, your children, somebody in your life that causes you pain. And if you don't feel that pain, it's because you haven't experienced love for that person. So it's actually a good kind of pain to experience in a lot of ways because that means that that person's truly missed and that they were very loved. So I think probably most of us can think of someone or a pet or something that made us feel that kind of grief. And humans have created rituals to deal with that, to deal with grief. We know that grief is a bad thing. We've known it for thousands of years, that it's hard when other people die. It's hard when really bad things happen from when we went from being stomped on by mastodons to now, right? We knew that it was hard when that, those terrible things happen. And so we created rituals. And depending on what your background is, what type country you come from, what family you come from, what religion you might come from, your rituals are different. But they all do the same thing. They all give you a place to grieve, to go through the process. And planning a funeral, to bringing your family and loved ones together, going through all those difficult things, burying someone, cremating someone, whatever it is that you do. Um, having memorial ceremonies where you talk about the wonderful things that that person did, the things that made you laugh. When my father passed away, um, he had been the director of personnel for the World Bank, so traveled to many, many countries, helped lots of people in different situations, and um, he was from Scotland, and so we went back to Scotland to bury him where he was born. And um, he, we couldn't go right away because I was pregnant with my last child, and we had to wait until she was three months old and had had vaccinations before we could travel overseas. So my father, who was cremated, was in my closet for a while before we went over to Scotland, which he would have loved and found so amusing. But anyway, we, my, his sister and I were planning. She was in Scotland and I was here planning this whole um, funeral and inviting people from all walks of life that he had touched. And what shocked me was how many people left Iceland and Pakistan and Japan and Australia and New Zealand and came to Scotland and stayed in this hotel that was the first place that my father stayed when he left home um, and came to this ceremony and then talked about who he was to them because who he was to them was totally different than the person that he was to me. And so that ceremony to me was so special because I learned all these things about my father as a caretaker, as a um, person who, uh, they called him Robin Hood because he would do things for other people at work and they would never know it was him. People would be having a hard time and he would give them something. And uh, they all told these stories of how things he had done had impacted their lives. So it made what was a really very hard thing a really very special thing. And that's because of rituals. So there are ongoing rituals that people have, like lighting a candle for someone. When you, when you go into church, people, um, send the light to whoever it is that they've lost, think of them. So those types of rituals are what take that pain and turn it into something that we can cope with, give, put us in a better place so that we can get on with the, with the living. So in our organizations, how do we bring that kind of feeling to the work that we do so that there's always a thread of joy in the work and there's a ritual that we can go to when things go bad? So we celebrate all sorts of things in our team. Um, this is from our Facebook page. Our driver managers, like Savannah, are encouraged when they're out on the road and our contract drivers, we have a lot of contractors as well that are out there and they're encouraged to celebrate the milestones for all of the shelters that are out there. So this is the first transport for the Humane Society of Cedar Creek in Texas. And they, could not have been more thrilled to get to put all their animals in one of our vehicles and pose with the vehicle and you know have it posted and be able to post it and it went into their newspaper and like those kind of things you know for those people for us it's the 
you know, 800 transport or whatever, but, but for them, it's their very first one. And it's the very first time that they've been able to take 30 or 40 animals out of their shelter and load them and then walk back into empty kennels. You know, that's pretty special. And we don't want to lose sight of that, about that's what we were bringing to those people. And this sharing of that joy gives back to the people that are taking those animals, that are cleaning all those kennels. That, you know, when we say we've moved 120,000 animals, somebody cleaned all those kennels, carried each one of those little wet noses out to the truck. You know, all of those things that go on are more special because you celebrate. So when you're looking at your organization and the things that you do, be sure that these little things that happen, that you take the time to celebrate them, take pictures of them, put them in scrapbooks, put them somewhere so that when you're having those hard times, somebody said, we think about the good things. You have to document the good things so that they'll still be there, so that all of the people that come behind you will know where you were and where you are now, and they'll become the people that take you to where you're gonna go. So, if you create a culture of well-being in your organization, of people feeling good about their work, it will help them with stress and difficulty in the job. So the other things that we've given you, you have a green card and a red card. So we'll start with our green card. So what I do in the shelter, if we were all in a shelter right now, and I usually do these presentations in the shelter, is we, before I came, you would have found the nastiest, oldest, beaten up bowl, stainless bowl, usually stainless steel they are, that we no longer use because it's no longer safe because it has little bite marks on the side or the metal's broken or whatever. It's a filthy, nasty bowl that we don't use anymore, but sometimes we don't throw those away. And so I like that we don't throw those away because it's, for me, it's a very useful tool to just give an idea for a ritual. So to me, that bowl represents all of the thousands of animals that ate out of that bowl before it became a bowl that we couldn't use. All the animals that we helped that went through your organization and that one bowl, we have no idea all the dogs that ate out of that bowl or all the cats that ate out of that bowl or all the guinea pigs or rabbits or whatever animal it is that you're taking care of or rescuing ate out of that bowl, but, but they did. And that's how it ended up in that condition. And so we use that bowl as a tool for the organization to represent that work. We do these in the evening so we can go out in the dark. And first, we write our happy story. So this is the story that you'd share at a dinner party that you would talk to people about that when you no longer do this work and you're retired, it'll be the one that sticks with you, the animal that you loved. This would be the story of Phoebe, the animal that was burned in the fire that got adopted and how wonderful her family was. And you might not be there the day that Phoebe got adopted, but somebody else might have been and might write this story up. And as you walk by the board, you see Phoebe's story up there. So even though you missed that she got adopted today, you see how Mark or Betty or whoever it is that you work with documented Phoebe's great story. So that's what the green cards are for. They're full of bolts and boards somewhere in your shelter that volunteers and staff and everybody can write on and put something up there. You can also take clippings of things. Sometimes people will send you an email where they say, you're the most amazing organization ever. I can't believe that we're so lucky to work with you guys. Cut it out, stick it on the green card, put it on the board. This is where you should go in the organization when you're having a really bad day and remember how awesome you guys are as a team and all the wonderful work you do together. Very simple green index card. And it's just an idea. This is just one ritual. So then, We've got all those up on our bulletin board that we've created before. Like the bulletin board's there somewhere in the facility waiting for this part of the exercise. And you guys can do this on your own if you want to take this one. Then we have the red card. So the red cards are for the worst stuff ever. The stuff that maybe you'll never talk to anybody about. The stuff that you're carrying in your soul that you know happened, but that you really need to let go of. This is the working through the hard stuff card. So we don't really want to sit in a group and like read out our cards and feel each other's pain and all those things often because it's too hard, it's too difficult to open that part of you up. If you can do that, if you're close enough to someone that you can do that with them, great. If that helps you, go ahead. But some people can't. Some people are, are gutting it out. You know, they're, they're just, they cannot talk about it. And so this, that's what this card is for. And you should do this on a regular basis, whether someone puts a card in or not. This is, a this is a gathering of the family, of the group that works together. And you can all show up with your cards. And what I like to do is there's a product called Mystic Fire. Really cheap, on sale on Amazon, late at night, you can buy some Mystic Fire. 
and you go out to your bowl and your bowl has a little bit of straw or something in the bottom and the mystic fire is already in there and everybody forms a circle around the dog bowl. And we talk about the significance of this dog bowl and the animals that we've helped and the animals that we've let go and the ones that we've been able to help and the ones that we haven't and all the stories that we have to tell and all the sad things that have happened and that we know that we are the people that we are because of those animals as well. And we're the organization that we are because we gave them the chance that we could give them and some of them we had to let go and some of them we may have lost in a very tragic way but that without us, none of them would have had any opportunity at all to be thought of, to be cared about. And so that's important too. And then we all fold up our red cards and we put them on top of the mystic fire and a little bit of stuff that catches on fire easily in the bottom. And it's great to do in the dark because this stuff burns up in a whole bunch of colors. And so colors come up out of this bowl while these things are burning. And I have done this with multiple groups they're still doing this particular ritual because they liked it. Some that have expanded it in different ways to do things for themselves. But I love it when I run into people somewhere and they say, hey, it changed everything for us because it made us think about those things instead of bottling them up. It made us share them as a group in a very easy way. And it made us support each other through that because here we are in our little circle and we all have something to contribute to the bowl. Maybe not this month, maybe next month, maybe three months from now. You can write as many of these if you, as you want. If you're bottling up a bunch of things, let them go. And fire is a really good tool for that. So we're going to do the same thing that we did earlier. Group one, group two, group three. I want you to talk amongst yourselves and talk about this ritual and like other rituals that we use as human beings in dealing with grief or um, maybe in your own family, maybe you've already doing something in your organization and see if you can come up with something that you think that you could take back, one thing that you could take back that might be helpful for this using this process of working through some of these really horrible things in your organization. Go. Ready to share out? Let's go backwards this time. Group three, who would like to say anything about something you've come up with that you might be able to do when you go back home? Group three? Anybody? Go ahead. This is one that we've already been doing for a long time. I'm only a volunteer. Huh? Did you say I'm only a volunteer? You're a volunteer. Yay. Yeah, I used to say that we name them all at the shelter because the lucky ones have a name. And no matter who, you know, they all have names, yeah. And that's nice. That's a, if that gives your team a feeling of being able to support that animal, even though you can't save that one necessarily. And that's, that's healthy that people understand that not everybody can be saved or should be saved necessarily. So good for you guys. Yes. Our uh, coworker Sarah here had the idea, kind of in the same vein as the green card. Um, each kind of has a cage card that has the animal's picture and a little description. So any uh, dog that gets adopted that we spend a lot of time with, maybe make a note of it and keep their cage card in like a little binder. So if you're ever having a hard day, you can go back and you know see yeah. all the good memories. Yeah. It's a great idea. Some people take a photograph when that animal's getting adopted and they attach it to the kennel card so that that stays too. So they're like, this is the family that adopted whoever. And, and when uh, many organizations encourage people that adopt to send pictures back. And so if you have somebody that's really into that scrapbooking, a lovely volunteer that wants to take that project, they can be the ones that just continuously do updates in that binder as well. So that's really a nice, nice thing too. Anybody else in group two? Group three, group one, going backwards, group one. Yes, ma'am. Um, we often will, if we get anything email or through our Facebook or website from the doctors, um, we post that so that not only can the public see it, but a lot of our volunteers and people that work with the animals. Um, but another thing we thought we would do is put together a binder with those things and also like things that get sent privately or little cards so that not only 
really, you know, we needed that boost to see all those positive things from the community and the doctors um, that, like, our volunteers can see that too. Occasionally, people get their panties in a bunch about mm -hmm. something with us, and you forget that that's like one person, and the other 99% of people out there in the public think work, and so it's just a way to remind us. Yeah, don't focus on the negative. That's right. That's really important. Okay. Oh, sorry. What, what first and then? Um, we introduced a gratitude board, so it's um, just post specific ways to thank people for their support in the back hallway, where everyone has to pass and they're spending the day. Really encourage staff to write anything, and sometimes it'll be something simple like chocolate or um, something more serious, like a, an ambulance. And it's just like that visual reminder that even through the hard times, there's always something to be grateful for. It did start as like people weren't writing on it at first, and then eventually it, we get so full that we have to keep racing it so people can write. You might take pictures as you erase, and then the pictures can become your archive. <laughs> yes. How do you get, you know, in your in an organization, get people to get on board? This. I mean, I've had, I've tried gratitude boards, and nobody would participate. The same one or two people will put something up there, it sat there for six months, and nobody's done anything. I'm constantly putting up, like, a team building thing. They call me Mrs. Happy at work, because I'm always <laughs> doing I catch a lot of grief for, for it. Um, so I'm wondering, how can I get this group to be more involved in sharing because they are great people. Have them help. How do I help? Have them help create the process. So the thing that will help them. And then you have plants in your group, right? Because they were on the committee that helped create the process. And so your plants are the first ones to participate. It's like if you have a meeting and you have people that never say anything, you go to people before the meeting and you say, hey, Savannah, would you answer this question about whatever? Let's talk about what we would say. And then so then once Savannah kicks off in the meeting and you know what she's going to say, but everybody else doesn't know that you asked her to say it first, it opens other people to, to say something. Like if you watch what happens here, there's like dead silence and you wait while there's dead silence and somebody volunteers and then all of a sudden all sorts of people have something to say. It's the same kind of thing, but in a process that they helped create. So maybe they don't want, they don't like your gratitude board, they don't feel comfortable with that, but they might be able to come up with a better process that they buy into, get four or five of them, and then the others will start to follow. So we had a face-to-face -face meeting last year, the whole team, and it was around Halloween time. And so we had little Halloween bags for each person that had their name on them. And at the tables, every time we broke for a break, you would write something on a card about one of the people that was in the, no, you had to do it for everybody, didn't you? You had to do it for one for, every, at every break you had to do one for everybody that was in the little bags and say something nice about them. So you had to sit and think about something nice. And then people left with their little bag and they got to open all of their little things. That, and you didn't know necessarily who had said it about you, but there were things in there that people had said. And it was a really cool thing because it was, because it was a planned activity, people, we're standing there participating with each other and then going on, on break. And because we're a remote team and we don't ever work in the same space, we, we see each other mostly on Facebook or something like that, you know, like where we post things, because um, we all live in different places and work in the, that one time a year that we're together, we tried really hard to, to do things like that, to put things together, like, um, wow, you always leave the vehicle really clean, and that's amazing. I don't have to clean up after anybody when I get in. Or um, even though it was pouring with rain, you cleaned really well, and that made a big difference to me. Or somebody left a, like a Starbucks card on the seat for somebody else that was going to be the next one in that vehicle. And I think about that when I'm in line at Starbucks sometimes because that pay it forward thing that you, some people do when they're in line, they pay for the people behind them. Well, that's pretty cool to do in a vehicle when you don't know who's necessarily coming next, but they're going to come and find something that you left for them. So... Um, those kind of things are, are things that you can try to bring into your organization by having it to be part of a planned meeting first and then have it just be a sort of a thing that you do. So anyway, so all good ones. So um, this is our fire since we can't have a real one because this is a different. But, but you guys can have a real one when you go home. And um, some people uh, don't want to do the card system, don't want to really make it about 
um, the stories. They want to make it about something that, that brings them all together. So, so the other handout that you have is the self-care handout. And the blank at the top is for your name, because this is your self-care. So we've talked about your organization a lot. We've talked about things that you can do to make sure that that team sticks together, that we don't want to lose that um, incredible amount of knowledge and passion and willingness to help that exists um, across our organization. But that starts with you and your ability to care for yourself. Um, so if you think about the first one, what self-care habits are you using now to focus on yourself and your health? I get at least eight hours of sleep a night as an example. So if everybody could just do their first one, and you can do more when you get home. The second one is, what do you want to do that you don't do now? What would you like to think about? What do you think about doing all the time? Like, I'm not, I should, really should do that, and I haven't. This is a commitment that you're making to yourself. The example is, I want to join a yoga class. Then number three is, what stands in your way? I'm not taking a yoga class right now because I don't have the time and I think it might be too expensive. So I am not doing whatever it is that you're wanting to do because of why. Okay, then on the back, number four, what solutions can you come up with to address the obstacles you listed? All of you are problem solvers or you wouldn't be working in this profession. We solve problems every day. And amazingly, things like can I take a yoga class is an overwhelming problem for us. Can I watch, binge watch that Netflix thing that everybody else is talking about that I never have time to watch and I'll miss my eight hours sleep if I start watching it at 10 o'clock at night. But I really wanna know what everybody's watching on Netflix, right? Just little things like that that you can problem solve. So I could look for discounted or free yoga classes or something all over out there that says free yoga class, so they're out there. Right? By cutting back on my volunteer work, by asking my friends about classes they attend and prioritizing adding self-care to my budget. So if you can't afford it, what else are you paying for? Alcohol, cigarettes, eating out, not cooking at home, whatever, um, that is stopping you from doing something that's healthy for you. So take a moment to read the self-care habits that you wrote down for item two, and then select one that you want to do, and then you want to commit to doing that one thing, and that you want to do that, you want to do that because, and for a lot of you, it's because I want to stay in this profession. Because I'm just starting out, maybe, for some of you, and I want to still be here 30 years from now, 40 years from now, whatever it is. I want a long career in animal welfare. Or for those of you that have done it for a long time, I don't want to burn out. I want to stick around, because there's lots more animals that need help, and I really love this work. And then you have to make a commitment with a deadline, timely. When will I do this by? And you keep promises every day to the animals that are in your care. You keep the promise of giving them of your time. So this document is intended to have you keep the promise to yourself to take care of yourself so you can continue to be one of the people that keeps those promises to the animals.